This could be a huge practice changer, or maybe the data is just way too low quality. Honestly, this time, I, I just don't know. So this isn't going to be a polished final product kind of video, probably going to be a little bit shorter than usual. I'm honestly hoping to get some conversation started, maybe learn something from the broader online medical community here. So the question is, how fast should we be correcting the sodium in severe hyponatremia? Now, if you're anything like me, your entire treatment strategy is based around one entity, osmotic demyelination syndrome, right? We were taught to go slow. If we go too fast, it can have some pretty severe neurologic consequences. So as an emergency doctor, I've honestly, you know, mostly ignored hyponatremia. Unless there's seizures or severe neurologic symptoms, the need for slowness means that this really isn't an emergency treatment. Turns out maybe I am entirely wrong. Apparently there's a lot of data that correcting sodium too slowly can increase mortality. So this topic came to my attention in the form of a systematic review and meta-analysis is AS 2024 JAMA Internal Medicine. They looked at hospitalized adult patients with severe hyponatremia, defined as a sodium less than 120, or severe symptomatic hyponatremia, defined as a sodium less than 125, plus either se severe symptoms, cardiorespiratory distress, seizures, GCS less than a decreased level of consciousness, that kind of stuff. They divided sodium correction up into four broad categories. There was the very rapid, where the correction was more than 12 mil equivalents per liter in 24 hours. Rapid was more than 10 to 8 in uh, in 24 hours. Slow was less, between 6 and 10 in 24 hours. And very slow was less than 4 to 6. And there's some overlap there because different studies use different definitions. And the primary outcome that they looked at here was mortality, although obviously they also looked at osmotic demyelination syndrome. I can't say that right today, can I? So they found 16 studies. That's almost 12,000 patients. The data is not the best kind of data. 14 of these are retrospective studies. There's one prospective cohort and one was an RCT, but it wasn't designed to look at this question. So really it's just a prospective cohort for our purposes. The mean sodium concentration was 115, so pretty severe. And here's the headline news. There's an association between lower in-hospital mortality and faster correction. Overall, I like the way they present their data. They give us the odds ratios, of course, but they also try to estimate the absolute risk, which is so important here because the baseline risk of mortality is very different from the baseline risk of osmotic demyelination. For mortality, they think that there's a dose-response relationship, so that the slower you go, the higher mortality. And they estimate that going slow would cause an extra 32 deaths per thousand patients, but going very slow would cause an extra 221 deaths per thousand patients. Those are huge numbers, 3% and 22% absolute difference. Now, of course, this is observational data. We can't prove causation. So we got to be really cautious here and we'll get back to that in a second. But let's briefly talk about osmotic demyelination. Now, there was not a statistical difference between the groups here, and that is probably because it's such a rare condition. So it doesn't prove that there are no differences. But if mortality is common enough that you can see a difference, and osmotic demyelination is so rare that you can't see a difference, it's a pretty good question here. Which one should drive your decision making? For years, we've made decisions based around this very rare osmotic demyelination. But it seems like maybe that's a mistake. In terms of absolute numbers here, they saw Osmotic demyelination in 0.3% of the very rapid group, 0.5% of the rapid group, 0.2% of the slow group, and less than 0.1% of the very slow group. All of those are less than 1%. And I could look at those numbers and see a dose response relationship, just like we expect, where the increased speed of correction does increase the rate of demyelination a little bit. But I could also look at those numbers and just be convinced that this is noise. 
Now, in terms of absolute numbers, the authors estimate that going slow would result in about 0.5 less cases of demyelination per thousand patients as compared to going fast. And going very slow would result in two fewer cases per thousand. But let's compare the numbers. Mortality increased by 32 and 221 per thousand. Automatic demyelination decreased by 0 0.5 and 2. Those numbers are orders of magnitude apart. So it's quite possible that we have been causing dramatic harm all because we've been scared of the demyelination boogeyman. There's some other numbers in this trial. Hospital length of stay obviously goes up if you're treating slowly, that makes sense. But none of the other numbers really matter if these mortality numbers are true. Now, of course, the data is far from perfect, and there are many reasons why the mortality numbers might not be true, or might not be causal, if you want to be a little more precise here. The big concern is confounding. Why are the patients severely hyponatremic in the first place? But more importantly, why did the doctors decide to treat some of them at different rates? Or perhaps why did their sodium correct faster despite the exact same therapy? We really don't know based on the data we have. This paper doesn't have access to the underlying patient data that would be used to guide clinical decisions. And so it's very likely that clinicians are acting with more information than we have. And so they're treating their patients differently. They might opt to go very slowly in patients who have severe cardiac disease. And maybe it's the cardiac disease, not the slow correction of hyponatremia that's driving the mortality numbers. And I've been reading a number of other sources about this. I'll put links in the, in the show notes. And the slower group does seem to have higher rates of cirrhosis, higher rates of heart failure, and higher rates of metastatic cancer. And therefore, we need to be really cautious about how we apply this data clinically. There's a reasonable chance that it's confounding, that's making this data messy, despite any attempts that are made to adjust this data. One thing is very clear looking at this. We need proper RCTs. Mortality is an incredibly important outcome. So the numbers are huge here. We can't continue to practice based on fear of a boogeyman. But the hard part of medicine is knowing what you're supposed to do while you wait for that science. I, I love science, but I still have to look after my patients tomorrow. Again, I'll throw some more of these links in the show notes, uh, but I've looked at a bunch of nephrology blogs that go over this topic in a lot more uh, detail if you want it. There are other studies uh, not covered here that suggest that the link between the rate of correction and demyelination actually is pretty tenuous. And it looks like there might be a stronger link between uh, the patient's baseline health status, things like alcohol misuse and malnutrition, but unfortunately we can't control those variables. Clinically, I think the most important information here is that the the rarity, right? The osmotic demyelination ha happened less than 1% here. And you compare that to the overall mortality, which seems to be an order of magnitude higher. I don't know. At the outset, I said, I'm not 100% sure what to do with it, this data. Now, luckily, if my audience is emergency physicians, which I, I think it mostly should be, I don't know. Uh, this doesn't matter that much in the emergency department. I'll put this up here. I love this summary of hyponatremia management. It's stolen from the Nephrology Journal Club. It compares the American and European guidelines. Uh, and these guidelines aren't even in incorporating this systematic review that I'm talking about today. The severe symptomatic patients, we got those, right? I've actually seen a few patients recently. They're seizing. You know, they're, they're easy. They get hypertonic saline. We need to get their seizures or their encephalopathy stopped. And, you know, the rare osmotic demyelination just isn't a consideration while they're still critically ill. For everybody else, if you look at this, this list, the management is really easy in the emergency department, at least, right? We break these patients up into three categories based on fluid status. Are they euvolemic, hypervolemic, or hypovolemic? And the nice thing is that two of those categories have the exact same management. So the only thing that we need to decide is whether the patient is hypovolemic. And if the patient is dry, you do exactly what you do with every other dry patient. You give them some IV fluids. Because for the other two groups, euvolemic or hypervolemic, we do nothing. The treatment is fluid restrictions. For now, you can just write an NPO order, stop IV fluids, and let the admitting doctor sort it out. 
because the rate of correction is calculated over 24 hours, this really shouldn't be a big deal for us in the emergency department as long as we work in a functioning medical system. If you're going to be looking after these patients for a long period of time, yeah, you're going to want some repeat labs. And if you're getting close to that, you know, 10 millimole correction rate over 24 hours, you're going to want to get some DDAVP, stop your IV fluids if you were treating hypovolemia. But there's not that much else to do. So as much as I think this paper is really important and it might change practice for our internal medicine colleagues, our nephrology colleagues, for now in the emergency department, there's not really that much for us to do, except for maybe alleviate some of that anxiety about going too fast. But I would love to hear some other opinions about this because I know there are smart nephrologists out there that understand that distal convoluted tubule, the collecting duct way better than I do. So leave your comments below. How is this affecting your practice? Does it affect your practice at all? Do you even care? Until next time, take care.